Hello and welcome to Electric Sheep, a podcast about free and open source technology and how people can use it to work smarter, not harder. My name is Paul Andrews and I'm one of your hosts and I'm joined by Mr. Carl Sykes. Hello everyone. And Mrs. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Jones. Thank you for messing up my I name. <laughs> the very first one. So the idea behind this is essentially it's a regular podcast uh, and each week we're going to have a specific theme. The theme for this very first episode is using technology to support administration. Um, so we'll be joined a little bit later on by a very, very special guest, um, and her name's Amanda, so she'll be popping in to talk to us about how she uses technology to, to essentially do her job um, and make her life a little bit easier. Okay, so we'll start off. Um, I'll just introduce myself and explain who I am and what I do. My name is Paul Andrews. Um, I'm a learning technologist, and I've been a learning technologist for the last 10 years. I used to be a maths teacher before that, and before that, I was a systems analyst, so I kind of did all the nerdy programming and web design and all that kind of stuff. Uh, these days, though, I'm very, very lucky. I get to run the digitally enhanced learning team within the University of Wales Newport. Um, and essentially what our job is, is to act as internal consultants and advisors and educators to all of the people um, associated with the university. So that's our staff and our students, our educators, our administrators and everyone else in between. And what we really do is we say to people, don't worry about what you think or is or isn't possible with technology. Tell us what you want to do. We'll find a solution for you and then we'll show you how to use that solution. And more often than not, we will go for free and open source solutions, uh, basically, so they can have a have a go without risking any, any money or anything at all. So if they try it and don't like it, then there's no harm done. So, yes, that's, that's my day job. Um, I'm going to hand over to my good colleague, Carl, now, who can explain to you what he does. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, it's a bit like the, uh, the warm-up warm up act following the main act there, but never mind. Um, yeah, my name is Carl Sykes. Um, I'm a learning technologist as well at the University of Wales Newport. Um, I've worked here for about four years, uh, about two of those years as a learning technologist, before that predominantly in, in administration, um, administration roles. Uh, my background is kind of audio-visual areas, uh, film, media, and, and other audio-visual audio uh, elements. Um, essentially, I work at our university city centre campus, working with staff and students to help promote the e-learning software um, and, and our virtual learning environment that we use as part of our education system here at the university. Um, I think that's pretty much everything I need to say about myself at the moment. I'm sure the, the listeners out there have uh, heard more than enough, so I'll probably pass us on now to, to Elizabeth to tell you a bit about herself. My name is Elizabeth Jones, and I'm also a learning technologist, so we make a nice little trio there. Um, I work at the same place, University of Wales, Newport. I support the other campus from Carl. Um, I, however, used to be a librarian um, working in the library here and at other universities. So I've done a bit of a right turn at the traffic lights there. Um, but I think it gives me a bit of background into people who don't really use technology quite so much. OK, so um, the idea behind each podcast, we're going to have a regular format. Um, so we want to start off by really talking about what we've been up to this week. So... Rather than me starting, because I've already done my bit, I'm, I'll come back to it a little bit later on. I'm going to ask Elizabeth. Elizabeth, what have you been doing this week? Uh, this week, I've been mostly focusing on um, a course that I'm running with the library called uh, The 23 Things. Um, it's a series of online training workshops um, dealing with all areas of web technologies and tools that they might want to use. Uh, we're introducing them to all the different technologies, a couple at every week. So it's 23, it's actually 23-ish things because it. I didn't just make this number up out of my head. You can't it's, count. Yeah, I can actually <laughs> count. There's about 27 in our course, but 23 Things is a course that has been run in lots of different libraries and universities um, around the world, actually. I think it started in America. I've never been able to find out where it originally started. But when I worked at Oxford University, they were running it there. So I got the idea from that. And it's been published in a variety of library journals. So we chose to do that to introduce them to all the different things that they might want to learn about with social media, networking, audio and visual tools just about everything really it's just a crash course over 12 weeks and so how's it going so far is it we're on week three yep. and i'm actually very surprised everybody has gone for it you know, full on and um even the ones who were dubious about technology have managed to chip in they're chatting away on the forums and i think they've really appreciated having somewhere online that they can talk to each other because like everybody in this university we're based across a couple of campuses so you can feel really split up from the people who are based on on the other campus cool so um so you're on week three 
Yep. What things have you done so far? What, week um, one, two, and three? Week one was looking at the university system, so virtual learning environment and Moodle, which is our um, learning and teaching system, and then looking at forums because the course is based around talking to each other in the forums. Then week two was blogging and uh, tweeting and tumbling. And week three is Twitter and Facebook and other professional social networks like Academia, Edu and LinkedIn. Brilliant. So so it, is the idea then that um, the folks who are doing this, they're going to create their own blogs and stuff that other people can check out? No, actually, um, we've done this a bit differently. All the other 23 Things courses that I've come across did do that. But um, in the reading that I did when we were looking up what, how to run this, we found that most people complained about how people did not want to sign up to all these things. And yeah. 23 Things can be a lot. If you're signing up for the first time to, you know, Google um, Documents and Gmail and blogger and all these different services then it's a bit overwhelming if you're never going to use them again so we decided that rather than signing them up and forcing anybody to do anything that they didn't want to sign up to we just take a look at how it works why it might be useful how the library itself might use it because the as a library they are signed up to most of these things but individually they might not be and there's no sense in forcing them when they don't need to oh cool so so it's, it's more like saying here are some things that you might want to use, but it's up to you as a professional to pick and choose. What's yes, right for and you. I've provided guidance for um, you know how they can use them if they want to, but there's no yeah there's no have to about it. Wow, that sounds really good. So um, once that's finished, uh, is there a plan to do anything more with them, or or will it be a case of taking that model and maybe saying to other de- other departments or maybe even other institutions, hey, look, we've done this. You, we're, might, you can do yeah. it too. We're planning on writing it up as a an article that might be published in places, but we don't know yet. <laughs> we'll see when I've written it whether it comes out all right. Um, but we'll definitely be running it with other departments and um, offering it as a, as a training course for our department. I tell you this now. <laughs> <laughs> I've been told. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's 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 fantastic. Yes, well, it's fantastic now. I'm, I'm, I'm constructing week four as we speak. Okay, what's week four going to be on? What's it? Week four is going to be about alternatives to traditional software. So the first thing is Google Docs, um, and I've briefly mentioned other alternatives as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we will be looking at Prezi for alternatives presentations and something else. Okay, Um that's really good. So um, I'm going to turn our attention to, to Mr. Sykes now. Mr. Sykes, what have you been doing with the City Centre campus this week? This week I've been working with um, a group of students who are part of the engineering um, a full-time and part-time cohort. Uh, our careers department have been working to try and put together um, a way of the engineering students processing their reflective practices that they've undertaken as part of their course. Um, so, so they had a presentation from our career service about um, ways to reflect on your study, ways to reflect on y- your employability skills, etc. Uh, and what I've tried to do is give them some options that are available to show how they can take those reflective um, uh, practices that they've undertaken and, and file them away somewhere essentially that they that's easily accessible but somewhere that's shareable as well whether that's shareable between themselves and their course tutor um, themselves and the rest of their peer group or even their employers for those that are in employment um, so I stepped in and took a, a half an hour session giving a presentation on um, e-portfolios specifically looking at the use of um, Google Sites to create an e-portfolio that's, that's easily creatable but easily shareable amongst themselves and, and, and anyone else they wish to share with. Um, so essentially I stepped in, created a presentation for them and gave them the theory behind the creation of an e-portfolio in the hope that um, outside of the lesson time they can take it away and, and actually look to create their own e-portfolios that they can um, fill with all the shiny stuff that they've done along the way whilst they're here at university with us. I'm going to be pedantic and ask you this question that I do know the answer to, but the people listening might not, which is, why did you choose to use Google Sites rather than the university system? Okay, um, there's there's a couple of reasons why I specifically focused with Google Sites on this. Um, I think think the two main reasons are, first of all, yes, there are lots of other alternatives out there, um, to name a few, Pebble Pad or Mahara, and they're fine and they do the job, they're great. 
The problem is that, you know, you collate all this really useful information over the course of one, two or three years while you're here at university with us. But at the end of those couple of years, you're tied into the university system. You can't take that stuff away with you and have a nice shiny package that you can take out and continue to build on outside of the university. Um, so it's nice to use something that essentially gives entire control to the student user, uh, which, I, which I think is the key thing here. Yes, it's great that the students can build their e-portfolios, but give them control of the thing they're creating so that they have have a package of uh, of goods really um, so, so essentially the, the key the key reason why we've gone with google sites is because um, it allows for lifelong learning and i think the key point that i keep trying to get across to students is that yes when they come away at the end of their two or three years of study they'll have a certificate they'll go to look for employment and they'll take a certificate with them but it's all about professional development and about the extra added value that you can give to an employer or you can just have to to kind of sell yourself to to whoever else it might be in in your future employment down the line so if you can take a certificate you can take a an e-portfolio of evidence of all the great stuff that you've achieved and undertaken you know why not make the effort to create that thing and and, and actually use it as a sellable tool that you can build on year after year after year and they've they've got the added bonus that they know how to make a website as well when they finish absolutely yeah of course i mean those sorts of skills as you know as well as actually creating the portfolio it's a great skill to add to your cv it's something to show that you've done things above and beyond the normal sitting in lectures and listening and writing essays etc you've actually got a skill that you can take out into employment and those things are hugely important nowadays as well as the kind of basic certificates and everything else you have to to kind of go out into the big wide world so yeah absolutely web website creation skills a huge tick in the box definitely brilliant um okay so it's, it's worth mentioning that we are going to we've, we're going to have a, a little website that accompanies this series of podcasts so everything that we've mentioned so far you will find links to all of this stuff on the website to check out if you want to get involved as well um okay then so uh, this week we had uh, at the university of wales newport we had a, um, a higher education academy event um it was all based around this thing called the co-curriculum uh, which, in a nutshell, it's basically all of the learning that takes place outside of the, the main course that a student does. So they might come here to do counselling, they might come here to learn about uh, sports psychology, uh, they might come here to learn about media studies, but in addition to their main studies, they might also uh, take on part-time work, they might do volunteering, they might take on other roles, which give them valuable skills, but uh, traditionally those skills and experiences wouldn't necessarily be acknowledged by their main course because obviously you know they've, they've got a curriculum to learn so the idea is, is this co-curriculum runs in parallel to that um, and it recognizes um, and acknowledges the the learning and experiences that, that they have so we had this event and we had a lot of people from around the country uh, turn up and we all sat down and talked about what we wanted to do within our own institutions with our students and also in collaboration with one another to um, support this development Development, support this idea of uh, recognizing students achievements outside of their main curriculum and so what we did as a department to support that we created um, a little website for the event and we, we use Google Sites um, again we use Google Sites quite a lot within the department uh, mainly because we want to demonstrate to people how these free tools can be used so people can look at that if they're coming in from another institution and go what did you use to create that and we can say well we use this tool and it's free and you can have a go as well so um, so we created a little, a little Google site for the event um, we also use Google Docs for the actual event itself one of the things we did was to have um, a breakout session essentially where people were sat around on tables uh, discussing uh, ideas of how they could support their students with the co-curriculum uh, where traditionally you know you might have a note taker with a piece of paper or sometimes you might have a like a big tablecloth and get people to write on it but this time what we did was we got laptops on each of the tables and we assigned one person to be the scribe or the note taker and they jotted all of these notes down that, that people were talking about on the table within google docs what this let us do essentially was after that session had finished and that session ran for about 30 to 45 minutes, we then broke for lunch. Because it was all online, we were able to capture all that information straight away, pop it into a lovely website called Wordle. Uh, and that basically what that does is that generates uh, word clouds um, based on the text that you, you put into it. And it analyzes the frequency of the words. And the more times a word uh, crops up, the bigger that word is in the word cloud. So the idea was that within about five minutes, we were able to pop on a massive big screen as people were eating their dinner, um, this big word cloud, so people could see the common themes that all of the different tables uh, had been talking about. In addition to that, we also then popped the actual transcripts, uh, the, the actual notes that had been made, 
onto the Google site itself uh, so that when people went home or went back to their place of work the following day, they were able to access those notes um, and see what was said. I was following along on Twitter and there were some really interesting things being said about what was happening and people seemed pretty positive. Yeah, I mean, it was quite nice as well because what we tend to find with these conferences is some people will turn up and they'll be quite vocal. Uh, which is great, but, you know, they want to share their ideas. But other people, are, uh, you know, they, 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 they want to engage, but they might be a little bit shy to do so. So what we were finding was we were having this, well, it's, it's called, what's well, called a back channel, essentially. But the idea is that people can jump onto Twitter and leave comments and ask questions. And we tend to find that it's different people who actually speak at the event compared to other people that jump onto Twitter. And it also gives them time to reflect afterwards. So we had a fair few tweets coming in after the event saying, uh, you know, giving us feedback about the day or what they've taken away from it. So it just gives them the opportunity to um, engage in different ways. I, you know, I'm following on from what she said about the use of Twitter. I like the fact that as well as the live event, you had the Twitter account, Twitter feed running, but also live streamed the event as well. So there was lot, there were lots of ways to kind of jump in, um, listen into the sessions, even though you weren't physically there, and actually kind of input into them. And I, I like the fact that that was included as part of the, this um, this event. Yeah, um, um, I mean, it, what we what we actually found was finally we were we were fully booked up, and people wanted to come, and they we couldn't we physically couldn't get them in the room. So we used a free service another free service called Bamboozer, um, which we had running from one of our iPads. And essentially what that lets you do is you, take, you hold the iPad up and it, it records what's coming in on the iPad's camera and it broadcasts it out as a live stream. So we were able to jump onto Twitter and go, hey, if you want to watch this, you can do. The beauty of it is that after we finish recording, Bamboozer automatically keeps that video. So it's almost like the BBC iPlayer and that people can now go onto the website we've created and watch those presentations again anytime they want to. So in, so in essence, essentially, it's, it's kind of extra bang for your buck in a way because you've come along to the session. But, you know, as you'll always do, you'll, you'll miss snippets and miss pieces. So there's always an opportunity to go back and, and rewatch the sessions again and, and kind of pick up on any points you might have missed the first time around. So, yeah, great. Yeah, so you know, it worked quite well. And it's something that we, I mean, we, we, we've done it twice now for two different events. And it's something that I think once people realise the power of it, uh, we, we, the uptake's going to pick up i think um because uh, most of the time you go to these events it's great on the day but then you go back to the day job and you kind of forget about it but this actually gives people the opportunity to engage with that discussion or that content or whatever it might be anytime they want to i think that's a great thing because there's even conferences that i attended like four years ago and it would be really handy to go back i made notes on some of the things but you know they're scribbles and it'd be nice to go back and actually watch those presentations again to remember why I scribbled something down about them in the first time and if it's still there four years later all the better yeah um yeah and especially as it's because it's, it's all done using free stuff it means that as long as you've got the actual hardware um any, anyone can have a go with this so it, it, there's there's not really because it used to be you had to have quite expensive equipment to do this but nowadays it's literally something that's handheld and you can just get involved Shall we just do a quick list for those who've been following along with this long conversation about this event um, and list a few of the tools that you used? Um, so first of all, we used Google Sites to create the event website. So like a hub. A hub. Uh, we used Google Docs for capturing live data that was coming in from the discussion panels. We uh, summarized that uh, with a free tool called Wordle, which generated the word clouds. Um, we also had a free website running called Visible Tweets, which was basically capturing all of the tweets that were being made using our event hashtag, and that was displayed on a, a big projector. We also, uh, for the presentations that we gave, uh, we used Pinterest, uh, again, because we had lots of resources to show people, but a very limited amount of time to do so. So we were able to say, well, look, it's all on this Pinterest board. Um, you can check this out any time you want to. So people were having a look at that um, during the event and afterwards. Uh, for the actual images themselves, we used a, a tool called Skitch, uh, which is a free tool on Mac and Windows that allows you to grab screenshots and annotate them. And for editing those screenshots, uh, we use another website called PicMonkey.com, which lets you upload a picture and edit it, which is very nice. And then we also, uh, one of the things we wanted to do was give people, rather than just give them resources, we wanted to tell them a story or give them a narrative as to how these tools fit together. Um, so we used a tool called Prezi to do that, to create an interactive timeline so people could walk uh, through and look at the student experience. That's great. 
<laughs> There's a lot of resources for one little conference. Yeah, yeah, it was it was fairly fairly intensive. Um, but um, all these things are free, yeah. so that's that's the great thing. Everyone can have a go, and it really doesn't take that much um, time to set them all up. No, no, it's, it's really it, it sounds it sounds a lot more hard work than it actually is to do. It's very very quick to set them up. But we'll put links to all these things on the. Um, on the website as well, so yeah. people can check them out if they want and, to. And actually, just to kind of chip in, but that's the really good thing about this. Having been to a number of conferences where you just get given a, a paper pack of information to take away, it's brilliant to be able to actually get online and, and see firsthand the stuff that's been created and actually look at it as if you're as if you're there in the conference itself and actually be able to browse the thing that's there as opposed to having to flip through black and white photocopies of presentation slides or whatever. So I think that makes a huge difference to the people who are coming along and making the effort to come to the conference. Well, and in these, like... <laughs> straightened financial times it's it's pretty good to if you if you can't afford to travel to a conference to be able to sort of attend it virtually and it means that your conferences even if people can't attend as much as you'd like can still have that huge wide-ranging effect on people's work and life it can still influence them yeah absolutely i agree absolutely Okay, so now it's time to introduce our very special guest. In fact, our first very special guest to Electric Sheep, Amanda Lawrence. Amanda, welcome. Thank you. Hello. Hey, um, so, first of all, before we get into kind of why you're here, can you tell us a little bit about what you do within the university? What's your job? What do you do? Okay. Um, I work within CALT, which is the Centre for Excellence in Learning and Teaching, um, and I'm the general administrator within the department. So it covers... CDEL, mm-hmm. CALT, obviously, uh, the library, careers, study advice, and then obviously the central, CALT. Wow. So essentially you kind of pull all of the strands together that CALT has and just and make it work into a cohesive whole, would it be fair to Ooh. say? Um <laughs> uh, well, basically, if you're not here, <laughs> if, if she says no, she's selling herself short. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's yeah. pretty much what she does. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, Amanda basically is is the glue that keeps every all the different parts of Celts working together. Yeah, she's organising a lot of people to do the same thing. And we can't do without her, basically. Oh. But she's far too modest, modest to say that. So, um, so yeah, so um, when we wanted to do this podcast, we basically sat down and said, right, OK, we want to get people in who will talk about how they use technology to essentially do their day job to make their lives a little bit easier. And one of the major things that people certainly at Newport University like to do is use technology to make administration and administrative processes a little bit easier. So we thought, who better to kind of come in and tell us how they, they use technology to do um, admin type things than Amanda? So, Amanda, what kind of and what kind of things do you use technology for on a on a day to day basis? Um, well, a big part is arranging meetings. A part is arranging meetings. Mm-hmm. So obviously, Outlook comes in handy. Uh, so I've got access to people's diaries. Yep. If I haven't, I can use the scheduling assistant within there anyway to see if they're available. Um, so obviously an email is pivotal. Um, also, I use Moodle a lot because I maintain the Celt Moodle pages mm-hmm. and also SharePoint ooh, for the um, <laughs> external <laughs> web pages. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I use that as well. Okay. And do you find that, I mean, certainly with the, with the calendar, do you have to say to people, hey, you know, share the calendars with me or do, do people need to know how to use their calendars effectively or is it just something that when you came into the job people were like okay i can i can do this this isn't a problem uh the majority of people can use them not everybody Mm -hmm. uses them which can be a bit of a problem Mm. um but you just resort to other other ways then um but even if i haven't got access to somebody there is a way within outlook of finding out if they're available or not and that that's the that's the scheduling assistant you were talking about so how does that work so let's say i want to arrange a meeting and there's, you know, there's five people I want to invite. How, what, how does the scheduler help? What does it do? Um, because it means if I haven't got access to somebody's diary, I can click on the scheduling assistant and I can view if they've got meetings that day anyway. Right. So it might not tell me the details of their meeting, but I can see when they're free and when they're not. Excellent. And that's a standard feature in just Microsoft Outlook. So yeah. a- anyone who's working in a company or university or a college or school that's got Outlook has access to mm-hmm. this feature so they could use it if they wanted to. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, so I've got a, another question for Amanda. Um, obviously, you use the, the kind of regular Microsoft Office package mm-hmm. in, in your day-to-day work, but are, are there any useful alternatives to those packages that you might use that um, sort of listeners might be interested in kind of having a look at and seeing whether, whether it's something that will help them in their day-to-day uh, working use? Um, well, I use Google Docs 
uh, quite a lot, which is quite handy because you can share things with a number of people and it's a working document. So I can see if somebody else makes amendments on that document. Uh, so everybody can work on the same thing, which is quite handy rather than duplicating one document or me changing one document when people tell me. Um, I also Dropbox, which again is a sharing uh, application. So um, I can save something and then if you're working at City, you can sort of view it. It's easier than emailing it and okay. etc. So, so in regards to just go back to Google Docs slightly, what you know, what applications would you use that in, instead of? What does that? What does that kind of? Uh, you know, what is it a better version of essentially? Um, Word. Right. It's okay. Quite, I wouldn't say better, different. Okay. It's, um, to Word, but I also quite like it for um, you can do questionnaires in there, feedback forms in there, and also calendars if you want to use it for you know other reasons other than outlook so it's got a huge amount of uses, it's loads of uses. It's, as well as kind of being an alternative to a microsoft package it's got sort of extra added yeah, features yeah. such as the, the you said there was a, a questionnaire function or something yeah. yes so, so I've done, and you can you know we've held ex events where external people have come so you can put a questionnaire in there and they can answer it from there because obviously you can't use moodle for external people so that's quite a handy way of getting feedback right from a big group of people Okay. Um, and uh, the other thing I was going to ask is, uh, and, you know, people obviously nowadays give a lot of presentations at conferences, mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. And, and I think PowerPoint's the route that most people go down. Is, is there something you use as an alternative to PowerPoint maybe that, um, you know, listeners might be interested in? Yeah, I've only used it a few times, but it is one of my favourites. Um, Prezi. Um, it just makes PowerPoints way more interesting. It makes them look just more impressive to be honest with you so much so that i've told everybody you know to use them <laughs> so um because it is it does look great and it, it is sort of view of death by powerpoint well it's not because uh it's just very witty right so, uh, okay and, and and you know i think the question that everybody's going to want to know the answer for is google docs dropbox prezi are they paid for are they free all free all free yeah fantastic so, uh, yeah i can't recommend them enough myself brilliant brilliant and so and we'll we'll put links to all of those on the website um, underneath this podcast as well so you can check them out if you want to absolutely all right so now you've told us about some of your favorites and things that you like to use um, have you found any disadvantages or things that have been really hard about adding technology to your job over the years because i know it's changed a lot since you know we all started in school and universities and work um well i've only been in this job for coming up to a year um, and since i've come here it's a revelation because i didn't know about dropbox or Google Docs or Skype, very sad. But um, so there were lots of things I didn't know about. So the, sort of the learning curve has been quite steep. But I've got the handy Seadell people on hand so I can nip down and ask <laughs> them whenever I like. Um, so there's that. But also, I think sometimes the more you get into technology, the less you actually see and speak to people. You do it all, it's too easy to email rather than ring or nip up. So I think that's a bit of a disadvantage sometimes. Yeah, keeping the personal balance. touch and yeah. actually knowing who you're talking yes, to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I find that a lot when I'm emailing people. I get to know their name, but I've no idea who they are, and I'll probably walk past yeah, them exactly. hundreds of times. Okay, so you mentioned Skype um, just then. Um, for those folks who aren't aware of what Skype is, it's basically a free service that's actually owned by Microsoft now that lets people um, essentially... They can talk to one another. They can either have uh, free video calls or free audio calls, or they can just do text chat and they can send files to one another. Um, and, it's, and it works on all sorts of different devices, computers, tablets, and uh, games consoles as well. Um, so with that in mind, Amanda, so you mentioned Skype. What do you use Skype for in your, in your, in your particular role? Um, well, I've got it open all the time. It's kind of, well, I think, it's sort of a quicker version of emailing people. You don't have to go through rigmarole of it. It's just quick and instant and the nice thing is you can do group chats so rather than send an email and one person replies and then another person it's all just instant so you can mm -hmm. all have a conversation yeah. at once but we've also used it um to hold meetings where perhaps everybody couldn't get to a meeting so the majority of the people are in a room but then other people can just skype in which makes that a lot easier no, that's really well. handy so um yeah so i suppose it's good if people don't have to you know drive a long way mm. and then well yeah because we're on cost. split campuses and mm. things that's a bit of a, a tricky one but when we had projects assistance last year to do the student-led teaching awards yep. um 
sort of we we had a meeting um, in half term and the bulk of the students were here but one had gone home mm. so he just skyped in so it was oh, fantastic. yeah it was really good so how does that work do you, ha- do you have them like on a little laptop or something uh- or on we a actually telly had or... on, a, on a screen and we yeah. all gathered around the screen. Oh, brilliant. But, okay. um, but yeah, but we've done it for a few different meetings mm. now. So um, yeah, it works really well, actually. Wow. Okay. And the kind of, and if people wanted to use that again, Skype itself is free. is free. Yeah, I put it on home now. So, mm. um, you know, and uh, on my phone as well. So brilliant. you can have it everywhere. Yeah, so, so it's, you just need the hardware to yeah. be able to actually do it and, and you can get involved with that. That's, yeah. that's really handy. Excellent. Uh, so Amanda, um, you, you mentioned just a few few minutes ago that you've you've now got Skype on your your sort of home computers and on your home phone. I guess the the kind of real um, acid test as to whether a bit of technology is is really useful is is there anything else that you use on a daily basis in work that you have kind of taken outside of work and, and, and use? So is there a bit of technology that perhaps you've kind of you kind of use at home now other than Skype? Um, something else you might use um, kind of on a day to day basis that is that it, you know maybe was work related to begin with, but you use outside um, work yeah dropbox i've taken that idea i've taken home and i've told lots of people about that so that's quite a handy one for me so um because you know i can save things at home and share them with other people photos and whatnot so that's quite a nice yeah nice absolutely of work rather than sort well. of cluttering up your email account mm-hmm. with with huge photographs you know you'll have because yeah. I, I you know i'm guessing for those that don't know, uh, Dropbox essentially gives you a certain amount of storage space and providing you don't go over that amount, you can pretty much put anything you want yeah. into it and, and share it with whoever you want to make it um, kind of, there's an option to make it publicly available or you can just share it with people. So I guess outside of work, yeah, for things like sharing, I don't know, um, photographs of, of family holidays or yeah. I don't know, maybe maybe sending your loved ones your shopping list for Christmas, <laughs> your Christmas wish list or whatever it might be, it's a useful tool. So yeah, yeah is, is anything else at all or is, or is, you know, kind of that pretty much everything? Um, that's probably pretty much everything. Um, the rest of the stuff is, you know, in work and it's useful. Yeah. But I, yeah. But no, but it's great. It's great to know kind of what, what you are using and it is useful. It's always good to know if there's something that you kind of pick up and run with outside of work. So that's mm. really useful. I have honestly recommended Prezi to, my brother is a primary school teacher. And oh, right. so I sort of told him to use it to make it a bit more interesting. So, um, yeah, it is a, wow. a great one. And is he, is he, is he used yeah, it? No, he's, yeah, no, he's had a go. It's, you know, it takes you need to play around yeah, sure. with it first, but um, but yeah, no, it's it's really good. Wow. Um, so what about what about the future then? If you could wave a magic wand and invent a piece of technology or a piece of software that will make your life easier, is there anything that you think? Oh, I really wish someone would come along and and invent this or create this or make this that I could use that would make my life as an administrator. Really nice, and, and and you can't say somebody to come in a robot to come in for you yeah. and record <laughs> podcasts, for example. That's not an option. So anything other than that, um, I can't. I am sort of Google Docs was a revelation to me mm-hmm. because you know, my, not in this job so much, but in my previous role, there was one document that everybody needed to work on, and it's yeah. kind of people would send me the amendments. I then had to copy and paste them in, or you know, do something mm-hmm. like that. So that is just. That, that is a bit of a revelation in that you know one there can be one document and everybody can do their own changes you know yeah. and uh, absolutely because so, so I that... think that was always a real mess wasn't it if you had twenty emails from different people with different things yeah. but all relating to one document it just got so messy and yeah. complicated that you you'd lose track very quickly in terms of what you were what you were doing and which document was the final finished piece yeah yeah but other than that I can't wouldn't tell you if I could think of something anyway <laughs> <laughs> I'd make money yeah. not before she's got a copyright <laughs> on it she'll be on absolutely. Dragon's Den at some point <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Brilliant. Well, in that case, then, I mean, all that remains for me uh, to say is thank you ever so much for coming in and speaking to us, Amanda. We are very, very grateful. It's been an absolute pleasure. I think uh, I think that's everything, and uh, really appreciate you coming in. Yeah. Okay. Well, that seems to be a good point to um, wrap it up and knock this one on the head. So, um, all that remains for me to say is thank you very, very much to Mr. Carl Sykes. Now, thank you very much, and I hope I hope that you've kind of really enjoyed listening to this podcast and. Uh, you know, uh, hopefully you'll tune in for, for episode two. Yep. And thank you very much to Mrs. Elizabeth Jones. Stop emphasising the Mrs. <laughs> Sorry, husband. <laughs> and, and me, yeah, so uh, me, Paul Andrew. So thank you very much for listening and we hope you'll be listening to us again very soon. Rocking the morning.